welcome to the show. And if you could real quick, if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube or you can subscribe or follow wherever else you're listening. I appreciate that. Uh, my guest today is Steve Whiteman, singer of Kicks. He has a new solo out record out right now. It's called You're Welcome. And the album artwork is, it's a very simple drawing that he does. And the story is, there's two stories, I guess. The You're Welcome thing is he would, you know, say thank you to the audience. And then he says, you know, jokes like, hey, you guys are supposed to say you're welcome. And uh, the album artwork is a little stick figure that he does uh, when he gives autographs because he got sick of just, you know, giving his regular autographs. So he drew a little stick figure. So that's the album artwork. And it's pretty cool. The album is really fun, bluesy rock riffs. Very similar to Kicks, uh, maybe a little bit of a departure on some songs, but really catchy tunes, and I really enjoy it. So we're going to break down some of the songs on that album. Uh, we'll also get an update on Kicks and what's going on with them. And uh, Steve's just a really fun guy to chat with, very open and honest, and some great stories. So enjoy it. Okay, please welcome Steve Whiteman. How you doing? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm great. This is amazing. This is a long time coming. I, I interviewed Brian, from your bandmate of Kicks. And uh, that was a lot of fun. So this should be good, too. Yeah. OK. You actually got Brian to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Is he not usually a talker? He's no. But Brian, Brian's like Mr. Ed. He only says something when he has something to say. And he's not like uh, he's not a very conversationalist guy. But when he has something to say, it's usually pretty interesting. Yeah. He had some good story. He had a great story about working with Stephen Adler when they were both kind of like, you know, Fucked up it. on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to you, though. You have a solo album. Um, this is cool because you sang on it and you play drums and bass on a couple songs. Where there's a couple songs where you play everything, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, I did everything on the demos, and when I when it came time to actually decide to go ahead and do this thing, I wanted to do it right, so I brought in some people who were more qualified than I am. So, uh, but there, I, there were a couple of tunes that I wanted to play the drums and the bass and the rhythm guitar and do all the vocals. So just because it's fun. You know, it's like a bucket list for me. Okay, yeah, because I just had Paul Gilbert on from Mr. Big, and he he does he has a solo album too, and he he said he likes playing the drums, like it's really fun. Is it really fun to play the drums as a? That was my first instrument. Yeah, you started out in a Led Zeppelin cover band as a drummer or something like that. I played in a lot of cover bands. It wasn't really just a Led Zeppelin cover band, but no, I started playing drums when I was like eight years old. Yeah, my dad used to take me out to bars and and I'd play to a jukebox and pass a hat and make about 20 bucks when I was eight years old. Like, woohoo. That's so fun. So some of these songs, uh, if we talk about, you know, the old days, like the song easy, tell me about this one because you wrote it. You said you wrote it about reminiscing about times when you were in a band, it was really easy to pick up girls. What is that like? Cause I I've never experienced that. I've only had rejection. So do you get a big ego if it's easy to pick up girls or, well, it's kind of a double entendre. I, I mean, you can say that it's easy to pick up girls, but you're also saying, hey, I'm easy. So you know, <laughs> I'm not that hard to pick up. So you can reverse it. You can go either way with it. Okay. So, and then the other song that's kind of like piggybacks on that is Get the Wild Out. So you talk about, you wrote that about, uh, you know, telling somebody to, one of your students who was getting married and you asked him if, yeah. hey, did you get the wild out? So do you think, but do you think you can truly ever get the wild out of somebody like if you're just if that's kind of your thing like you just want to like fuck everything in sight like can you really get ever get that out like do you guys ever I'm, get sick of that i'm living proof yeah you can okay get the wild out. like I'm you just got bored of like being with a bunch of different women well it's usually they're a bunch of sluts usually and when you come to the realization these aren't nice girls i wouldn't take these girls to meet my mom and when you finally do meet that girl that you want to take to meet your mom then all those sluts go in the rearview mirror so you just, yeah, you don't have that desire to go, you get the wild out basically, right? You get the wild out. Yeah. And then once you find that special girl, then, you, you know, you're, you're ready to settle down. Yeah. And so, and are you married then? 38 years. 30. Oh, cause you got the wild out a long time ago then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Um, another song shock. You wrote that about when you were back again, another stuff song about the old days playing in cover bands and you were wearing makeup and girls clothes. So those are like the kiss days. So was it more like the kind of, was it like glam rock then? Or you didn't have like the Alice Cooper kiss makeup kind of stuff on, right? Pretty much. Yeah, we did. Oh, you did. We wore, yeah, we wore goofy clothes, high heel shoes, you know, those, those big high heel shoes. And I wore knickers and a, and a, a stupid hat. <laughs> and I, I had lightning bolts going down my face. So oh. yeah, I, I was all in. We, we were all in. It was the era, you know, it's just yeah. what you did. 
the lightning bolts on that's okay that's different i haven't i haven't seen too many people do that is there pictures of that somewhere there probably is but i won't share them <laughs> oh okay i was gonna say i was like i've never seen you with lightning bolts that's kind of cool um let's see what else we got prick teaser i love the title of this one uh I, me too it's like <laughs> so yeah and then like the tug of love uh, it's again another song about sex both those songs are really blatant really catchy songs i love the songs but I feel like some artists are trying to get away from that and like, oh, we don't want to talk about sex. That's not, a, you know, and you're just like full on embracing it. So why is that different for you? Because I got the wild out. Now all I can do is dream. <laughs> <laughs> you're not worried about getting like me too or any of that stuff or being no, politically correct. Nah, fuck that. Don't yeah. And, and you're not worried too about, because I feel like that was a, like bands of your era. That was a thing where they got lumped into this, like, oh, all your songs are just about partying and sex. And, and so a lot of bands were like, no, we're going to be more serious. And you're saying, ah, oh, I fucking love sex. So this is, we're going to yeah, write songs about it. Exactly. I love sex. I love making people laugh. I love that party atmosphere. I love, uh, I love sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, that's been the motto for, for my whole career. So why change now? But you you don't you never got into the drugs really right it was more just not drinking really, not yeah really. yeah um, because you know Kid Dynamite I mean that is a little bit more of a serious song that's about your guitar player Ronnie and uh, he, he's obviously been battling addiction for years um, how's he doing right now is there any updates on that last I spoke to him he he was um, he's he's working like two normal jobs he's still he's still in, living in like a rehabilitation clinic and. Um, I think I, he still has a ways to go. I mean, even when he's uh, he's set free and go out into the world, you know, like you did before, we still have to make sure that he's uh, he's going to be able to stay clean, and sober. So, but right now he seems like he's doing really well. He's following all the all the rules and he's he's doing everything he can to get his life back in in, in order. Well, that's good, yeah, because he was sober for what, like ten years or something like that, and he was totally 20 fine. Twenty. Twenty years, yeah. Oh, so and then it was just the pandemic that. It was even before the pandemic. Was that before that? Okay. Yeah, I he he got Hep C, and hmm. he had to he had to use intravenous needles to to battle the Hep C. It was before the newer treatment came out. Oh. So, and I have we all think that that just kind of took his mentality back to the days when he was using. And oh. uh, I mean that, that that's speculation. And okay. You probably have to ask him that. But sure. That, it seemed like that's when things flipped for him. Oh, that's rough. Well, I'm glad to hear yeah. he's doing better then, because uh, you know I want everybody to be doing better. And then, yeah, um, we all do. yeah, bad blood. I mean, that's so that song about is about having good friends and having a falling out. And I think everyone's experienced that. And you you don't want to name names on this one, but I mean, you could kind of like guess who it might be about, right? <laughs> yeah, you can guess. Yeah, I mean, because I've heard you tell I've heard you tell the story about with Donnie and how you just like he yelled at you about you, you wanted to use some. Uh, song on funny for funny money and he, he screamed at you and that was the last time you talked to him do you think you'll ever talk to him again i mean do you or is there a part of, are you just done with all that or is there a part I'm of you that's like all that I, i've moved on yeah i mean I, I, last time i spoke to him was 95 and i 95. was saying hey i'm going to use a song yeah. that you and i put together and he just tore me an asshole and i i took it i let him get it get it all out spew all of his nastiness and i thought never again hmm. and hung up and i said I'm sorry you feel that way. Always respected you, but now I don't. <laughs> hmm. That's really sad. And he hasn't he hasn't said anything. There hasn't been anything in the press, or he's just kind of been laying low, huh? We don't have. We well, have no idea where he's at, what he's doing. Um, no clue. And honestly, don't care. Yeah, that's that's yeah, interesting though. It's just it makes me. I don't know. For some reason, I'm curious. I'm just curious. Like, what happened? Like, what? Why is he so angry? Like. I don't know. I guess we'll never know, though, unless he ever no, comes forward. But he was always angry. He was he was a very much of a control freak, and and when when he didn't get his way, his his anger just spewed out of him. And it wasn't just against all you know the bandmates. It was against everybody. It was against record company uh, management, agents, all the road crew. It was it was just his 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 dominating personality, and it it was hard to take. So how we lasted eighteen years is beyond me, and and it's been eighteen years without him and it's and it's been wonderful (laughs) interesting so is that your advice if people have a relationship or friendship like that is to just get out and don't look back absolutely get out of it because it just it just drags you down then you know life is short you want to you want to go through it happy and if you're not happy get the hell out i don't care if it's a a marriage a, a girlfriend a band whatever it is if you're not happy doing it get the hell out oh that's great advice i love it so uh Let's see, Lightning Bolt, that was a really catchy song. Uh, Strip, that was a good song. 
um do do me like you done before another like that's a great like a blues blues rock song yeah that's just the old uh yeah just a boogie woogie song yeah yeah great stuff so now what are you gonna do um with your solo career are you gonna do some live shows or a tour like would you consider opening on a bigger tour or i don't even know if i have a solo career i never really intended to put out a solo record i mean it just kind of it just fell into my lap jimmy chalfont our drummer and Brad Bivens, who, who produced it, were getting together in Brad's studio at his home during COVID just for something to do. And they were, they were doing cover songs and putting them out on, the, on, on Facebook and wherever and just, you know, collecting clicks and likes and all that. And Jimmy just said to him one day, you know, Steve's sitting on a pile of, uh, of originals that I don't know if, if they're kick songs or not. Maybe he, we can get him over here and record a couple of them. Brad was just trying to get more experience in his studio. So they invited me to come over and I took my little pile of songs over and we sat and listened to all 12 of them. And Brad said, let's do all of them. And I said, well, it looks like I'm making a solo album then, doesn't it? And he goes, yeah, why not? So then we got Bob Perry involved and of course, Jimmy and in COVID, you know, kind of it, it got worse and we, everybody had to go back to their houses and, and record from, from their house. So everybody learned how to, how to make records from their home because you had to. Mm-hmm. So, but those songs were, you put, uh, presented them to Kix and Kix didn't like any of them or? I, I got crickets when I sent them out to him. I mean, I literally got crickets from him. So I just realized, okay, then this stuff, uh, I can't write Kix songs, but I can write Steve Whiteman songs. So that's, that's what I did. So that's interesting. Yeah. Cause so, some of these songs, I mean, like I said, I, I'm trying to think if there, I don't think there's a bad song on the record, in my opinion. Like I think every song is like really catchy and I could definitely, I mean, they, some of them sound like Kix songs. That's because of my voice. Yeah. I mean, it, well, and the riffs. I feel like the riffs are very, they're just real catchy, like tug of love. I mean, that's just like, I, I could totally hear Kicks doing that. But I guess if they, yeah, if they didn't want them, then I guess they're they're your songs now. Well, there's also, I don't know if if everybody would be ready to do a Kicks album anytime soon, just with the, the economics of it and um, the work that you have to put into it. And the reward is very little. So sure. If you're not a rich band and we're not, you know, we didn't make a ton of money, so nobody really has that stash of money to just throw new music out for the fans just because you want to throw new music out for the fans. But you couldn't do it like you did this solo record, just the same thing as the, as the way Kix doesn't want to do it that way? No, I think there's a higher standard for them guys, and uh, especially Mark Shanker. Mark Mark and, and uh, Taylor Rhodes really hit it off when Taylor uh, produced Rock Your Face Off, and <sighs> yeah. I don't think Mark would want to do it without having Taylor involved, and Taylor doesn't come cheap, and mm. um, we did it in Mark's studio in, in his house, and but we did have to go to a studio to record live drums. So it's it's an endeavor, and it's expensive. God, but I love that album so much. Like I, that's your best album. Would you agree? I don't know if it's our best album, but it's damn good. I mean, it's we were all proud of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. "Love Me with Your Top Down" is such a great freaking song. Like, I think that's my favorite yeah. Kick song. It really is. Like, I love that song. We still do that one live because that one that one still gets over. That's that's I believe that's that one and um, um, Wheels are my two favorites off that record. Yeah, those 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 are great. And then so yeah, so but um, because you said Brian is going to do Rhino Bucket shows in January February, so maybe yeah. you could do some solo shows then. There's a chance. I mean, I I really haven't put a whole lot of thought into it um, right now. In order to do something like that, Brad Divens would not. He's on the road with Enrique and Glacy, so. He would have to be around. Um, I'd have to go through a whole bunch of rehearsal just to just to get enough material together. Because I don't think twelve songs would would make a set. Um, I don't know. It's but, not. I, yeah. I, I never say never because if, if Brad's around and they would want to do it, and if if we just did some opening stuff and played an hour, you know, maybe we could do something like that. Yeah, uh, you you could play kick songs and funny money and and solo yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, I think that'd be funny. awesome. Yeah, I would say either like do the local shows like we're in your hometown or uh, if you could get an, I think an opening slot on some like a bigger tour would be fun. Who the hell would have me? What? I mean, <laughs> Kicks can't even get on a bigger tour. How? Why would they let me on a tour? You can't? Really? No, uh, not. But we do festivals and we do casinos and we do local clubs and theaters. But th we've never had an offer to, to do uh, to open for anybody. That's shocking. Yeah. Because I mean, you're definitely one of the, the bigger bands of that era. Like I've seen other ones that go on tours together and have you tried to reach out to some of these guys? Uh, how do you do that? 
<laughs> I don't know. I assume I mean, that you. We have an agent that yeah. you know, puts feelers out all the time, but uh, maybe they don't want to have kicks open for them. Maybe they, they see a little bit of a threat of uh, of a bunch of a bunch of crazy ass energy driven guys that that could uh, possibly show them up. <laughs> <laughs> or would you have some some bands open for you and do like a three band tour? Like, oh sure, I, I, like I say we 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 do that all the time. We. We go out with Slaughter and, and Great White, and Vixen, and all you know all the bands of our, our yeah. era, Tom Kiefer, and we open for those guys, Tesla. So we're all great friends, and we all see each other a good bit. And uh, yeah, but we do that all the time. But it's on weekends. It's you know, it's sure. Like fly dates. Hey, did, now you guys have you've never done a show with ACDC, have you? Never have, but man, would we have loved to have done that, dude. That would be an amazing show. I feel like that would, you, you'd be the perfect opening band for ACDC. I agree. Have, have you ever had any interactions with them or met? Because like, I mean, it's just it's just similar vein of rock. Yeah, we. I mean, they were definitely a heavy influence on us. And we did actually get to meet them at the Capitol Center in D.C. one night. Our record, um, our record guy from the area took us down to, to see their show and got us backstage to meet them. And it was real brief, but it was exciting. And, you know, um, yeah, you got their number. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'd love to have them on the show. That'd be a lot of fun. Like. They I'm sure they got some great press, stories. Do What's that? They don't, do much, they don't do much press. No, I know. No, yeah, like that and like Axl Rose. I think that'd be a really fun one too because I'm sure he, he doesn't, doesn't do any do, press. And he's, he doesn't do anything. He's a fascinating I saw, guy. I saw Axl, not Axl. I saw um, Angus and Brian on Dean, Dean Del Rey. You know who that yes. is? Dean Del Rey, the yeah. comedian. Comedian and a podcast, yeah. He's a huge ACDC fan and he somehow got those guys on his podcast. And then he had Phil... And then he had um, Phil Rudd, and then he had um, the bass player, uh, Cliff Williams. Oh, wow. He had, he had the whole band on, but but he had Angus and, and Brian first, and then the other two uh, solo. But great interviews, too. Oh, yeah. I've heard some of his, like, yeah, I, I've definitely listened to a lot of the Dean Del Rey stuff. Yeah, he's got some great guests. Pretty amazing. I'll say. I don't know how he gets them. <sighs> connections if yeah if you yeah. with the com, in la and the uh, comedy scene there and everything it's like it's weird how everything is all connected with the music yeah. and yeah did you ever live in la or have you always lived on the east coast well if you call making a record in la we lived out there twice because you're usually out there for a couple of months and, okay um, i hated it i just was not my scene i'm an yeah. east coast guy through and through that whole phony baloney here's my card and i do this i do that i'm i'm me i'm you know, it's just too much. I mean, I, I, I couldn't take it. Really? Okay. Yeah. Cause I don't really like it either, but yeah, it's, that's interesting. I thought if you're, if you're a bigger rock star, I would think like you fit right in. There's all the other, or is it just too much competition or. Well, there are lies a bigger rock star. We've never been rock stars. You don't think I've so? Never, I've never considered myself a rock star. Never. But you have fans. You have, I mean, that's only. Rick, Mick Jagger's a rock star. Rod Stewart's a rock star. <laughs> those guys that have mansions and multiple cars and 10 wives, those are rock stars. I live in Hagerstown, Maryland, in a little ranch home with my wife of 38 years. That's not a rock star. But you're still able to make music and make a living off of making music. And what well, also you do the teaching and stuff too, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I consider myself fortunate that I'm I'm 65 years old and I'm still doing what I love to do when I was a kid, so... Yeah, and you guys had so much success with uh with Kicks. So tell me about this. I know this is a little bit of a rerun because I've heard you tell the story before, but explain to can you explain to my audience how you um you bankrolled the money during the Midnight uh, Dynamite album time? Like the uh, the record company wasn't putting in a lot of money, so you guys would like go out and do a bunch of shows and then you, use that money to save up and t do your own tour and stuff. I thought that was really yeah. cool. That's well, we had no choice because the first album what they put out, they put the itch out as a single that, that was before MTV meant anything. So there was, there was no, uh, no videos. Second album, they put out cool kids, which we hated. And we did a video for that. that sucked and body talk, which we hated, we put out a video for that. And it sucked. So the third album, we had new management. We had Bo Hill coming off all the rat success. We had great songs for the record. We thought this is the one this can't miss uh, the record company put out cold shower and it was done. And it's like, fuck this. Huh. We're not, we're not doing this. So we had to have amassed a, a huge following on the, on the East coast. Like we could go from Boston to, to Florida and we decided it's time to branch out. So we would play 
and bankroll a ton of money because we were making pretty good money back then. And then we would do our own tours. We would go to Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland and the whole Midwest come back home, bankroll some more money, go to Texas, go to Nashville, go. And we just worked our way across the country and finally got to L.A. opening for Guns N' Roses. And they were unsigned. We're on our third album on Atlantic Records, big, powerful Atlantic Records. And we're opening for unsigned bands at the Whiskey or whatever the hell it was, Troubadour. And um, but people out there knew who we were. Well, people were um, actually very disappointed because they thought we were going to be headlining. And when they come in and we were done, they were all pissed. So the next time we played, we played our own gig and it was packed. So oh. people knew about us out there. So it was these tours that you were bank, uh, that you spent, uh, spent your own money. They were doing well. Like people were showing up cause you're out. You still yeah. had the album and okay. Well, yeah. that's what got the records company's attention. Finally, they, they saw all the work and all the effort that we put into that making our own tour with our own money. And they started to see all the interest. So they, they pushed the magic button on blow my fuse. And the other thing that happened on blow my fuse is a radio station in, I think Kentucky picked it up and ran with it. And they, you know, they knew it would do well in our, in our, our area, in New York and Baltimore mm-hmm. and DC and all that. But when they saw it outside of our comfort zone and they go, Oh, we got this. And then they pushed that magic button and, you know, put out videos and got on tours with rat and great white and Tesla and white snake and went to the UK, went to Japan. So that album, you know, really, really catapulted our, our careers. And we thought, okay, finally we're in. And then hot wire down the toilet. Oh yeah. And then that's, I like that album. I like a lot of the songs, but I like how well, I've well, never, there's, there's this little band called Nirvana that came along and kind of kicked everybody out of the party. Ah, that sucks though. I like how you said um, you went from playing arenas and large theaters to clubs and what what'd you call them? French fry stands. French fry stands. That's pretty much <laughs> what they were. They were, they were, they were burger joints that we try to convert into a, into a rock show. And when it got to that point, that's when we all looked at each other and said, it's time to put this down. Let's, let's take a break and let's see if this, uh, this grunge shit doesn't, if it doesn't go away, then we're fucked. Yeah. And you never thought of like, Hey, maybe I should join a different, like change my style and try to fit in with the grunge. Nah, hell no. Never even enter our minds. Um, not us. I mean, when you've been doing a genre of music your whole life, you can't just flip it. I mean, and if you do, you're a phony. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I mean, I know, like, you guys were on CMC Records, and like, you had that 1995. Was it Show Business? Is that the one? Yeah, yeah. And that's like, it's true to your sound, even in the mid '90s when most bands yeah. were kind of trying to fit in with the grunge more. And right. Yeah, but you guys stayed true. Well, uh, that album did nothing, and and that's when we really knew that it was over. And uh, Brian had left the band. We brought in Jimmy K. Bones and he had left the band. We were just, we were getting exhausted just bringing in people and having them leave, leave us because they, you know, they thought we were, well, like you thought we were rock stars and we weren't. And the, the, the offers kept going down. The money kept going down. So it was almost impossible to maintain a living at that. So I bailed. We all decided it was time to bail and I started teaching. Right. Yeah. You, and then you started the band Funny Money. So yeah. was Funny Money, it was more just like kind of like a hobby band at that point? Um, it, it was to get your yayas out. You know, I missed it. I, I took about a year off of, of playing and just did nothing but teaching. And then uh, Billy Andrews, uh, well, I was doing a fundraiser in Baltimore, and he approached me and said, um, I'd like to come up to your house and talk to you. I, he was just trying to get me off the couch and back out on stage. And I he come up and said, you got any, you got any music laying around? And I played him a bunch of stuff that I had been writing. And he said, we can put a band around this. So we did. And it, it got us back out and I loved it. They lasted about five years and then they all decided, okay, we're not going anywhere with this band. So I brought in another bunch of guys and that lasted about 18 years. And then I, when kick started playing way too much is when I thought, I, got, I can't be doing funny money and playing all these kick songs in funny money and then going out as kick. So mm-hmm. it's kind of competition for kick. So I had to, I had to put it down. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, so with the teaching, you teach uh, vocals, drums, guitar, and harmonica. And you, and some of your students, Jordan White, he's kind of a big name. And then obviously Lizzie Hale of Hailstorm. Um, who's the next Lizzie Hale? Is there somebody you're teaching right now that's going to, you think is going to blow up? I'm not teaching anymore. I oh, you're not? No, nope. the school shut down when, when COVID hit. And 
I, I just came to the realization that I was, I was tired of doing it after 25 years of, of teaching. I'm like, it, it felt good to not have to go out and teach. And I liked it. And I, I, I didn't really need the money. It wasn't that much money. So huh. I thought I'm just going to put it down. I didn't charge that much. I only charged like $30 a lesson. Wow. That's a steal. It is a steal, but yeah. I help people. Yeah. You know, I, I, if you charge somebody a hundred dollars a lesson, they're going to take two. If you charge somebody 30, they're going to take 10. In the long run, you're going to make $300 over $100. That's the way I looked at it. That's Well, and also that sounds like you just have a good heart and you actually want to help people. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what are you doing now? I mean, besides the solo uh, the solo album is done and Kix isn't, I mean, Kix has a few shows, but so you, are you just basically kind of re- semi-retired in a way? I would say, yeah, that's one way of putting it. I mean, Kix was busy as hell. Uh, um, at the end of May, we worked from May, June, July, August. I mean, almost every weekend, two, three shows a week, just to make up for all the shows that we that we missed uh, through COVID. And then we got COVID, and we had to shut it down for about a month and, mi- and missed like another eight shows because it, it was it was weird because I got it and I, we were vaccinated, so nobody really was was in harm's way. I mean, it was very mild for all of us, but. It, 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 I would get it one week, then Mark would come up with it the next week, then Bob Perry got it. And then it just it spread out to the point where we had to take the whole month off and lose a whole lot of shows. So it, even though you're vaccinated, it was a breakthrough cases, yeah. and, and, but it was mild enough to, or I mean, it was severe enough that you had to cancel shows. Like it wasn't just well, like. We didn't want to infect other people. I mean, you're, if, if you have it, you can not infect people. So we, we followed the protocols and we, we all uh, quarantined and, you know, we, we, we wouldn't fly with it. We wouldn't go to, to shows because you're around a whole bunch of people. Even even if they're not in your band, they're, they're still around you all the time. And we didn't want to infect other people. So we decided to shut it down until everybody come up with a with a, a, a negative test. Yeah. So was it just feel kind of like a, a bad flu or how, how severe was it? I mean, you say it was mild. For me, it was it was I thought I was getting a, a, a little bit of a cold. Now, I mean, I basically had to clear my throat a couple of times a day, Okay. A slight headache, and um, I lost the taste and smell for about a week and a half. Okay, and but then a week and a half, it came back then. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. You'd have all those symptoms even with the vaccine, though. Yeah, but many people are going, you know, that's why the, the boosters are out now, because a lot of people are, are breakthrough cases who, you know, you, you thought you were you were safe, but... The vaccine didn't uh, didn't last. So well, that's why it, out. Yeah. How, how long from when you got the vaccine to when you got COVID? Because maybe the vaccine had run out. Obviously, um, I got him, my second shot was in March and we got it in September. So just about six months, which is okay. about, that's about the time when they tell you you need a booster. Oh, really? I, see, I thought it was like seven or eight. I thought it was. Well, I think six to eight is what they say. So, yeah, six that's about. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Wow. Crazy. Well, so that's uh, hopefully that's in the rear view mirror then. So you do have some shows on the books for kicks yeah. coming up and, um, oh, are you still doing the, the P90X and all that stuff? Staying in shape? Oh, hell yeah. 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 Good stuff. All right. Well, I'd like to end this episode with a charity. Is there, is there a cause or a charity that you want to promote here at the end? Um, I have two really close friends and one of them is our sound man, Joe Corcoran, who has an autistic child. And Ronnie Yunkins has an autistic child. Mm. So if it was a charity for autism, you know, I, I think that would be the one. Okay. Yeah. I actually had uh, somebody on Kenny Wilkerson who he edited like a cookbook with a bunch of uh, rock stars and it was like autism rocks. And it's that, that's mm. a, that's a good charity autism rocks. I think they do. I think that's the name of the charity or they, they work with the ch- another charity that helps. So I will put that in the notes along with uh, the link to your solo album and, uh, and the kicks tour dates and all that good stuff. Great. Okay. Well, thanks so much for doing this. I'll see you later, Steve. My my pleasure. All right. Bye bye. All right. Well, that was a fun little chat with Steve Whiteman, singer of Kicks. New solo album is out now. It's called You're Welcome. It's available everywhere. You can even get the physical CD on the Kicks website along with all their other albums and lots of really cool merch on their website. So follow Steve on Facebook. And I think Kicks is on all social media. You can follow them as well. And while you're on social media, you can give me a follow and the podcast and everything. And I would really love you to subscribe to the show on my YouTube channel. It would really make my day. Uh, I'm really trying to get my goal of a thousand subscribers there. So that would help me out. Uh, In addition to Steve's charity for autism, I'm also doing a uh, no shave November. 
If you couldn't already tell, uh, it's the, the reason for this is to bring awareness to cancer. And the idea is that you don't shave or get a haircut and you embrace your hair, which uh, of course many cancer patients lose. And uh, then you can donate the money that you usually spend on shaving and haircuts and grooming products to a cancer charity. So I think we've all known someone who has battled cancer. Uh, my own father had prostate cancer and thankfully was able to beat it. So just something to keep in mind if you're alive right now, be grateful. I am definitely grateful for every one of you. I appreciate you all. I hope you have a great rest of your day and remember to shoot for the moon.